like I started watching what wealthy people do. Mm-hmm. Like what 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 are the really really wealthy doing? Right. I have a client who every year he goes out and purchases a piece of real estate. And I never knew much about this guy. He's kind of very like, you know, very polite. Like he's a business owner, that's all I know. And he was purchasing this property, a million dollar condo. This was two years ago, and it was a horrible investment. I said, Wilbur, man, like the HOA in this condo is twelve hundred bucks a month. <laughs> like it, it, this That's is ridiculous. not like what are you gonna do? Rent this out? And he's like, <laughs> Nah, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I said, What do you mean? What? He said, If I don't buy it, the money's gonna go to the government. Welcome to the Untapped Potential Podcast. Today, we're tapping in with Lucas Pinto. He's the CEO of Lucas Pinto Real Estate Group here in Seattle, Washington. In this episode, we talk about his roots in Brazil, growing up in Florida, and risking it all to travel across the country to Seattle. We also dive into how he got his start in real estate, his own real estate investments, and his thoughts on the future of crypto. That's I was going to ask you, um, because I, I, I know that you're from Florida. Mm-hmm. Do you spend a lot more time in like the, the warmer climates, like during the winter than you would normally do? I do. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I moved out here, I was ready to get out of Florida. I was born in Brazil originally mm-hmm. and I was raised in Florida. Uh, but now, you know, like, dude, I'm ready to get out of here and go, go back to Florida. Right. So I keep, you know, I find like during winter months, like every other weekend I'm going back somewhere either florida or somewhere sunny the weather makes a huge impact man. it really does it really does you know like in regards to like you know recharging and motivation when the sun is out i feel amazing so i right. i need a little like you know a little, a little break during winter months so and, and now like i have you know years ago when i was starting the business i didn't have that luxury now i do mm-hmm. where like i could be remote for a week for two weeks and and things won't break down and business right. is good as usual. So how was it uh, growing up in Florida? Cause you said you moved to Brazil when you were six or from Brazil when you were six mm-hmm. in Florida, right? Like tell yeah. me a little bit about that period of time. Yeah. So, I mean, when I first got here, dude, coming from Brazil, every, everywhere in the world, they look at the United States as like, Oh my God. So when I got here, I'm like, this is the coolest shit ever. Yeah, and you You have the oh for sure, (laughs) but you have those memories though. You were that young, but you remember it. Yeah, I remember. Everything was bigger, better, and and I was just so excited. I was like, "Oh my god, I'm in America!" And uh, they put me in like ESOL, right? Where where like the the classes for you to learn. Oh, that's right, because you didn't know English. I didn't know English. Yeah, so you speak Portuguese. I speak Portuguese. Oh wow. wow, still fluently. Well, you know, it's it, fluently, I'm able to communicate, but I feel a lot more comfortable with English today than I do with Portuguese. I feel I'm on yeah. the same boat with Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up speaking Spanish my whole life, but, you know, you stop using it as you get older. There's not yeah. as many opportunities. Yeah. So yeah. it goes yeah. away a little bit. And yeah. when your parents are working all the time, too, like my parents were, I, like, I, there'd be days, like literally days at a time where during the daytime I wouldn't see my parents and yeah. I would just see like other kindergartners. And yeah. I that's how I lost my Spanish a little bit. Yeah. Were you yeah. the only one in your class uh that was portuguese speaking in eso i was the only one dude yeah i was the only one there there were you know i understood spanish really quick because those would be my friends because there was nobody who speaks portuguese but i remember like there were uh there's this kid who some spanish to me was much harder but like spanish from like argentina i was really able to understand or spanish from colombia i was yeah. able to understand you know but yeah those became my my first friends here in the states were, were gotcha. hispanics yeah yeah what was your family like uh so we came over here like the original plan was was for us to come here for wasn't for us to be here indefinite and ended up staying that way. Mm. Um, but you know, once we got here, my parents went through a divorce. Um, I had a sister who's, who, I still have a sister who's older, right. who I'm very close to. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up well, but it was just, um, my parents were always fighting. You know, yeah. like they can never make that relationship work. So when they got divorced, me and my sister were like, oh, thank God. It was yeah. more of a relief for yeah, you. Yeah, it was like perfect. <laughs> over, yeah. And and that and money was always an issue. Mm-hmm. As long as I could remember, money was a problem. 
Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just in my family. It was everywhere around me I would look. I'm like, mm-hmm. man, there every there's a shortage of money everywhere I, I go. Did you grow up in a, a low income community in where you what, what it, city in Florida actually? So Naples, Florida. Naples. Yeah. Okay. So here's what's interesting because in Brazil we were, you know, high middle class in mm. Brazil, and when we came to the states, I didn't realize it, and it took me years for me to kind of understand it. But mm. we were low class in the mm. United States, like, mm-hmm. um, but Naples, Florida is a really wealthy community. You know, like I, I, it, it's it's a really rich retirement community. So the kids that I went to school with, most of those kids were wealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until like middle school that I started to understand, oh, I'd go to someone's house and I'm like, what? This is how you guys live? You yeah, know, that it started right. to kind of come together, like the gaps. And then high school, it was really obvious because in high school, you know, freshman, sophomore year, everyone's driving a BMW and I never even had oh. a car in high school. You know, it, yeah. it wasn't even a thought. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's as I got older, I started to realize that that the gap was there. Did right? you internalize that, though? Like, I got to hustle. I got to grind mm-hmm. because I'm trying to get my family out of this situation. Or were you kind of in the mentality of like, oh, wow, we don't have a lot kind of like victimizing yourself. How did you internalize it? I don't think I don't think I've ever. I think there were times where. You know, I'm like, damn, I wish I had that cool car, you know, or damn, I wish I had that. But I never felt bad or sorry for myself because I didn't have it. Uh, I always approach those people. I'm like, dude, how'd you get that? Mm. Oh, my dad bought it for me. What does your dad do? Like, I I was just always trying to understand, Uh, like, like what do they know that that I don't know, you know? Right. Uh, So, yeah, it was always like that. And still today, like, I see someone that's at a higher level that that's achieving. It could be outside from money, whatever it might be. I'm curious. I'm Mm -hmm. like, great. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. I want to learn how to do that. Right. Yeah. And and I I think it's interesting because I see a lot of people that they see that and they get mad or they get upset or they envy a person i think that tells a lot about like where that it tells more about the individual who's making that judgment than the person who has it for sure whereas like it hurt their ego it for you it kind of internalized the fact that you know i want to understand how to get there it kind of motivated Mm -hmm. you right did you have any uh mentors like during that period of time in high school yeah, so actually he was kind of like a second dad to me, right? So when I was a when I was a junior in high school, my dad went back to Brazil. And my best friends my best friend at the time, still my best friend today, his dad was uh Dr. Novak, he was a brain surgeon. Oh, wow. And he was he was like my second dad, but he was really wealthy, kind of like the the rich dad. <laughs> Literally dad. rich dad. Yeah. Dad. So after my dad left, I went to live with my best friend and him. And it was just interesting to see the habits that he had on a day to day. Like he worked every day. Mm. He didn't need to work every day, but he did. Mm-hmm. And he he was always up super early in the morning. There were certain little habits there that like, I think subconsciously I picked up from him. Uh, my high school football coach was another, you know, huge mentor and, and influence. But at the time there wasn't like a clear, hey, you're my mentor. It was just kind of picking things up sub- subconsciously as I went through right. life. Um, and I'm very grateful for those people, you know, Mm -hmm. like, I think, I think, um, the easiest way today for anyone to accomplish anything that they want is to find someone who has it and just do what they do. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. And I think with that though, comes, you know, you got to have a mentality of willingness to learn, Mm -hmm. like, you know, being willing to open your mind to just sit down for coffee with someone or just reaching out, which is kind of nerve wracking for some people. Yeah. For you, you were fortunate enough to have some people that were already around in your life that you identified that had the skills that you wanted. Yeah. How did you make the move from Florida to Washington? Yeah. So I finished high school and everyone was going to college and I just felt like a loser, dude. Like, you know, no one told me that 
we had to pay attention and get good grades in high school. So, I'll, you know, like, <laughs> like we finished that thing and everyone's going to college and I'm like, uh, what? Like, and so right. Naples, I just felt like the city was closing in on me. Like everywhere I go, people are already oh, going to college. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to college. You know, I can't take out that kind of debt to go to college. That's crazy. That never made sense to me. Mm-hmm. So... I, within a matter of like a couple of weeks, I'm like, I'm getting out of here. I'm, I'm moving to Seattle. Why Seattle? I don't know. Open a map, look good across the United States. The minimum wage here was much higher than the rest of the United States. Right. Um, so, you know, I, within a couple of weeks, quit my job. I bought a plane ticket and, um, I did a a job. We were just talking about this, right? I did a job for a lady who, uh, Miss Linda, my mom used to clean her house and she approached my mom and she was like, Hey, your son works at a restaurant. I was a bar back at a restaurant. She's like, would he want to help me throw this party for a few close friends to dinner? He will help us serve some dishes. And my mom was like, yep, absolutely. He could use the extra money. So I helped her out for a few hours, uh, maybe two to three hours. And, uh, when she went to pay me, she, Gave me an envelope. She whispered in her in her husband's uh, year. Didn't know what what she said. And she she gave me an envelope. She said, "I don't want you to open this until you're home." And it was a check for twenty five hundred bucks. Wow! And that check was like I had maybe like twelve hundred dollars to get over here. So that check was kind of what got me to Seattle and what kept me here because the first like year was rough. Ooh. My mm-hmm. first year here, I made something like eighteen thousand dollars. What were you doing at that time? I, I came here, I I I landed and I'm like, okay, where am I gonna go? Didn't even know where right. I was gonna go. I ended up renting a room, which I thought was a house, but when I show up to the place, it was a manufactured home. So I rented a room in a manufactured home. I lived there for the first like nine months. I bought a 92 Ford Escort because that's all I could afford. Yeah. And I had maybe like a little bit of money left. I found the job at this restaurant in Bellevue, still there. Still know the owners, great guys. Caspian of Bellevue. It's a Persian Caspian. restaurant. And I was like a, a bar back or slash server there. Right. And they didn't have a job for me full time. So I worked, you know, 25, 30 hours a week. And yeah, made something like eighteen, nineteen thousand bucks the first year here. Wow. It, yeah. And during that first year, did you ever hit that like, oh shit moment? Like, you know, I should probably move back home or like, were you always like, no, I'm going to stay here and figure this shit out? Yeah. So moving mm-hmm. back home to me, I, I've, I've always been good about this. Uh, when I make a decision, I tend to burn the boats. Mm-hmm. So I told mm-hmm. everyone. I'm going to Seattle and I'm going to start, you know, I had all these things I wanted to do. So yeah. the, the option of going back was never there. Um, and, and plus I didn't have, here's what's good about coming from a family where everyone's broke. You have no one to rely on. <laughs> like, you know, so there's like, no, it, it, it's like, there's no plan B. So therefore you have to figure yeah, it out. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it got tough, dude. You know, there, there were months, the first couple of months where I'm like, okay, do I, do I pay rent or do I get groceries? And you know, the, like the ethical thing for me was always to pay my bill on times, figure, figure it out. I have an obligation to this person. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the first year was rough, but I never, you know, I was happy, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like, I'm figuring it out. I'm like, I was, I was motivated. I was reading everything I could, I could put my right. hands on, you know, I was determined to like, let's figure this out. You yeah. know? Did you have a plan at that point? Because, I mean, I imagine all your peers were going to college at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, you're probably seeing, I mean, I don't, what year was this? This was 11 years ago. 2011? 2011. Mm-hmm. 2011. Yeah. I think Snapchat was around. Or if it wasn't, let's yeah, pretend it was. It just you're probably seeing your peers, you know, on Facebook, Snapchat at the time, like out in college Having doing this, blast, showing yeah. all their highlights. Yeah. And you were, you know, over here working at a restaurant in Bellevue, a brand new city across the country from where you were raised. Yeah. How did you internalize that? And like, you know, did you have a plan that, you know, even though this is what your reality looked like, did you already have a plan what you were going to do in the future at that point? Dude, that, that's the interesting thing. Cause I, I see a lot of, of young people today in their early twenties and they, they put so much pressure on themselves to have it all figured out. Mm-hmm. Dude, like 
we were talking about this 10 years ago, I had no clue Mm -hmm. who or what I wanted to be. Real estate wasn't even an idea at that point. The go at the time was, okay, I'm serving. Damn, a bartending job makes 50K a year. That's what I want to do. So Mm. that like the go was just like become a bartender. Yeah. You know, so it's... Um, no, I did not have a clear plan. I I knew from a young age that I wanted to get the the money situation sorted out. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know how though, you know, but I explored a lot of different things. I would get books and and stocks and I started playing around with stocks at a pretty young age. And I was just curious, you know, like the the end goal was financial freedom. I just didn't know how I was going to get there. Right. Right. And so where did, when does real estate come into the picture for you? Real estate came in in the picture after, so I went, did the bartending thing, made good money. People make good money as a bartender, yeah. dude. Mm-hmm. You know, I was making like, you know, a good 70, 80K a year bartending oh, wow. Wow. Three, three to four nights a week. I and was this like, was yeah. 10 years ago? The, I was uh, 20, as soon as I turned 21, 22 is when the bartending started. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, and then I went and got a inside sales job uh, at a tech company quote wizard yeah. i was selling uh uh insurance leads to insurance companies and that was uh-huh. my first sales job mm-hmm. right i had a good buddy who was like oh you should get in sales i think you'd be good and i was really good at it that was my first six figure job great benefits yeah. everything you could possibly imagine it like i thought i arrived mm-hmm. you know i was yeah, like this yeah. is it dude and real estate came into the picture after i did that for about 9 months and i'm like ah, it's just not I don't just don't feel fulfilled in any way. You know, that the money is great. The benefits are great. Right. And I saved up, I had some money saved up and I went to one of my best friends at the time and he was, he was at the, at the ground level of Zillow and Zillow is a billion dollar company today, but he was there right. like first 50 people that were hired at Zillow. Oh, he wow, was there. Wow. Yeah. So very early on and he was older much wealthier. So I went to him and I said, Hey, I'm thinking about getting in real estate. And I told him why and this whole idea that I had. And he goes, man, don't get in real estate. It's way too competitive. You never make it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that, that was it. Next day I got, I quit my job, went into real estate. I, I was 23, 24. Yeah. I went into real estate and what told you to go against his advice though yeah. internally dude i was driving home just so devastated you know we had this conversation at nighttime at his yeah. house and i remember that drive home and just that feeling of like because i was thinking about it for so long and like mapping mm-hmm. it out and i had these visions of what it would look like and i was always so fascinated by real estate right. but all, all also very intimidated by it right yeah. i felt i always felt like well, I didn't go to college. I'm not smart enough to do real estate or this mm-hmm. or that, or, you know, I'm foreign. I'm not smart. You know, all these things, man. And that drive home was just like, the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, who the fuck is, who is he to tell me what I can't yeah, do? Right. So yeah, next day I just, I'm like, look, I'm a, I'm a burn the bridges again. You know, I quit the job. I went all in. Yeah. I've always been very good at burning the boats, man. You know, if if you have no other option. Yeah, throw then, all the chips in. Like, let's yeah. go all in, baby. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So gotcha. So you started off. What was your first role? Did you were you like an independent realtor or were you part of a group? So I was independent realtor and first day in real estate, I'm sitting around saying, Okay. I'm a real estate. What do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the business is supposed to come to me, right? <laughs> so what I, and I spent, and I tell my realtors that join my team now, you know, I spent six months, the first six months spending all my money on dumb crap that didn't make me any money, building a website, getting business cards, doing this, doing that. It, it was, it was a complete waste of time and money. Yeah. I got myself into like credit card debt, a bunch of credit card to that after six months. And I was too, uh, I was too determined to figure it out myself and do it my own mm. way. And it really started to click probably around the fifth month where I joined a brokerage where, um, there was a team model and there was a lot more training. 
and a lot more guidance. Mm. And and at around the sixth or seventh month, um, and I was, I mean, I was running, sh all my money was gone, credit card debt, sixth or seventh month, I closed my first deal. And I think in the next six months, uh, I went out and sold like something like 17 or 19 homes in six oh, months. Wow. Oh, wow. And, and made that's a lot, right? For yeah. people who don't know, that's for, a pretty good volume for someone starting out. Yeah. For someone, yeah. for your first year, that's really good. Your average realtor in the United States today sells about three to four homes a year. Wow. And wow. you were doing that a month to get to that volume. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, so the, the first year, you know, right around the six month mark, it really, like I cracked the code and it, a lot of it, you know, looking back, it was so mental. Mm. It was so like, after I sold that first deal, I'm like, Oh, I could do it again. Yeah. And then it just, it just kind of snowballed. And it's it, what I love today about having a team is seeing other realtors do that in about mm. two months. My average realtor is getting their first transaction in about six weeks. Wow. And you see that period of like, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, boom, they get their first deal and they become a different, a completely different person. Interesting. What is, what is it that flips that switch though? I was just going to ask. At that. least for you personally. For me, what flipped that switch was, I think we look, myself included, I try not to and I realized this as I got older. We look for outside validation to be who and what we want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the outside validation was, oh, someone hired me. I closed the deal. Therefore, I am a realtor, right? And it's very tough for people to to try on a new hat in life without that outside validation or confirmation from the outside world. Right. Um, but I think the only way people do evolve and grow is by seeing themselves there first, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. So for you, was it just being part of this group and surrounding yourself with successful people in your field that gave you that confidence yeah, to step out like that? The, the environment was huge. I think my habits also changed yeah. around that time. Like I would be driving around in a car and the only thing I would play was something real estate related from someone who already made mm. it in real estate. So I was listening to that day in, day out. Yeah. And it kind of became like this weird like obsession of like, I was failing so miserably and getting smacked in the face so much right. that I just got personal with it. I'm like, mm. okay, like either mm. this thing is going to crack or I'm going to crack. You had to eat, sleep and breathe it yeah. at a certain point. Right. Yeah. Yep. And it, yeah. it you know, you eventually, and it takes time, right? Like it, anything that you go do in life, if you go to the gym, you start working out today, you're, you're not going to see the results right away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where most people fall off, man. It's so, mm -hmm. it's really challenging for you to put in the work. It's easy for you to put in the work when, at the st when you finally make it and all the work that you put in, you see immediate results. But when you're starting off, it's the analogy I always give is you're, you're pushing a boulder uphill and you're right. eventually going to reach a point where you made it to the top. Now you get to enjoy the ride down. Mm -hmm. A lot of people quit before they reach the top. Yeah. So, so in a hyper competitive market with real estate here, mm -hmm. you mentioned in another interview, there's about 27,000 real estate agents in mm -hmm. Washington. What, like in terms of the first year, first year real estate agents, like of the population of that, how many of them actually get a sale? Versus like leave entirely. A great question. So statistically nationwide, 82% of realtors quit within the first two years. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. So when, when somebody comes uh, and I get a ton of people that reach out now, they're newly licensed. Oh, you know, I, I want to join your team. And I sit down with them and I lay down all the stats in advance. Um, but what's interesting is that it's, it seems really competitive, but it's really not because most people are not mm. true. I look at real estate as like, this is my craft. Mm -hmm. How do I master yeah. this craft for the next 10, 15, 20 years? Most people don't look at, at real estate or whatever they're doing as a craft. Like this is something I want to master for, for a lifetime. They look at real estate like, oh, how can I make a quick buck? How can mm. I sell a house? Those people weed out. Mm -hmm. and, and the 
you have to be truly uh, intrigued by it for you to dive in deeper. Yeah. Right. Like every year of my career, I'm learning, I'm doing something completely different. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like this year we're starting a syndication that also falls under real estate, but a syndication is a completely different beast than real estate sales. Right. right. It's like, it's a whole brand new world. You know, I have to yeah. get registered with the SEC, get a bunch of attorneys involved. It's like, it's a different beast. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But that, that to me is like, it's fascinating. So for the people out there that don't know, what exactly does it mean to build your own team, your own real estate group? Yeah. So building your own real estate team is for the consumer, the benefit of working with the real estate team. And, and by the way, the whole real estate industry is going that direction. Five to six years down the road, you're probably not going to see individual realtors anymore. Yeah. And the reason for that is because consumers demand a lot more today than they did years ago, and they'll continue to demand more. The benefit mm -hmm. of a team is my job on the team, if I'm a realtor, today I'm the team lead, right? But the realtors on my team, their job is to educate the consumer and negotiate contracts, Yeah. period. So there's a person on the team that their, their, their whole role is to uh, draft up contracts and make sure the con yeah. make sure the contracts are perfect. Mm -hmm. There's another person that their whole role is to show houses. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that model, those are completely different jobs. An right. individual realtor trying to do all those things won't be as effective and the consumer experience won't be as good as mm -hmm. if you have right. a team. So team, the team model is becoming, it's, where real estate is headed. Yeah. Right. I bet it's really effective right now where there's such a high volume of sales that you need a lot of people to keep up with that demand, right? Right. How does that translate, you know, in a market downturn though, when we're not in, in the same situation that we're in right now? Yeah. So dude, the beauty about real estate is that the, the smart people in real estate will make money in any real estate market. And here's yeah. what I mean by that. The market is really hot right now, but who is it really hot for? It's really hot for sellers. Mm -hmm. Sellers are having a heyday. They put their house in the market, sells right away. They get a ton of money. Who's it really difficult for? It's really difficult for buyers. Yeah. Let's say there is a market downturn. The market crashes again like 07, 08. I know realtors who grew their business exponentially during the crash. Why? Mm -hmm. It's because they shifted their business model. Instead of trying to work with more sellers, now they go to a bank. And they have to deal with the foreclosures and the short sales. Mm -hmm. So it, it's regardless of what the economy or the market is doing, there is business to be done. You just have to adapt. Real estate is like any other business in any other industry. It, it's if the, mar if the market shifts, yeah. your strategy has to shift, right? So, I mean, personally, I hope there is a market downturn. I will like, I'll go out and buy everything that's out yeah. there. If there's a market, <laughs> I'm ready. You know, yeah. um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's adapting yeah. is the biggest thing. I, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the team building. You mentioned when you first started with your own group, um, you had difficulty hiring the right people. Mm -hmm. Now it's not the case. How is like the, the change in how you bring people onto your team change for you? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So great question. I, I did a lot of training and I took a lot of courses, um, and I learned from a lot of other team leads that are much higher position than I am in regards to leadership and, and how to hire and get rid of people, hire, hire slow, fire fast is what mm -hmm. they say. Right. I think the biggest shortfall when I started compared to today is I didn't set crystal clear expectations mm -hmm. today. Everyone who joins my team, number one, like we vet them for a couple of weeks. We make them take personality assessment tests. Mm -hmm. There's no right or wrong answer. I just want to see what kind of individual I'm dealing with. And does that individual fit, uh, fit the right seat I'm going to put them on the bus? Mm -hmm. And then setting crystal clear expectations and making sure, like, for example, when somebody onboards with us, we give them a whole training program that we walk them through. Uh, we give them a 30-day uh, checkoff sheet. Here's your focus for the next 30 days. Right. You sign it, I sign it, and I'm going to check in with you every week, and we're going to see if you did what you were supposed to do. Mm. Here's what you could expect out of me. Here's what I expect out of you. 
and we sign it. We both understand it and we keep people accountable. I think that like, that's everything really in, yeah. in, not, not just in business, but in a lot of relationships, it's, it's setting crystal clear expectations. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I want to, I want to ask you um, in terms of like your approach with social media, mm -hmm. when did that like switch turn on for you? in terms of like, this is kind of like the next level, how I access more consumers for my business. Yeah. So I think it was probably about a year and a half that it really kind of hit home, maybe two years ago now. I had a, a real estate consultant that I paid to come in and, mm -hmm. and, and coach me. Um, he was under the Tom Ferry organization. He's the biggest real estate coach in yeah. the nation. Um, and this was a guy, my personal coach was a dude that built a mortgage business, like a massive mortgage business, mm -hmm. sold it off, travels the world, does whatever the hell he wants, you know, and he was yeah. taking a couple hours a week to coach me. And he was the one that hammered the point home of video and social media. Mm -hmm. And where it started to make sense for me was, okay, how many conversations for example, in real estate, it's a, it's a contact sport. The more people that know me, the more people that I talk to about real estate, right. the more deals I'll do in a year. Mm -hmm. How many hours will it take me to talk to 100 people on the phone? Mm -hmm. Several hours, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. How long does it take me to reach 100 people on video? Like put it out there and it's right. like within seconds, I get Wait. 100 people or 200 or 5,000. And it will be there paying dividends for years to come. Yeah. So when when I started seeing it from that perspective that I could put out a piece of content on YouTube, on Instagram, forget about it. And someone years later by doing yeah. a, a Google search could, could come across that video and that could get me business. Yeah. So I feel like we're not doing video enough. You know, I have mm. chase right now, part-time like my goal within the next year and a half is to have a full production team, like full-time following us around, cranking out reels and TikToks and YouTube yeah. and, and whatever else. Um, I think that's a much faster way for our generation to get their message across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. One thing I've noticed too, that's becoming more popular is like real estate influencers. Yeah. Right. Like these people are huge on TikTok, on YouTube, yeah. Instagram. Yeah. They're just posting like these little bits, 60 yeah. second clips. Like, yeah. Hey, you want to buy a house in this neighborhood? Yeah. Da, 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 da. You know, three steps. It's yeah. always three steps, two steps, things that are quick. Digestible. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I think that's so cool. Have you, you know, is that somewhere where you want to go into more, like actually get into that influencer space or, to, or not really? Yeah. So, so where I want to take this thing is I want to create so my number one focus right now is the syndication the syndication is basically yeah. a platform that will allow my team and other past clients to buy real estate with me i've been buying real estate for years mm -hmm. i have 22 doors that i own myself those 22 doors bring me seven eight thousand dollars a month of pure profit wow if everything goes to shit i'm getting seven eight g's a month passive income passive income right. I, mm -hmm. I don't do anything i don't touch it i don't think about it and that's just in rent or yeah. After I pay my mortgage, property manager, insurance, the seven to 8,000 is my cash flow. Wow. That's my wow. pure profit monthly. And now here's what's interesting. If I have a group of friends that want to come and invest with me, let's all do this together. It works. We're making money. It's not rocket science. Right. Anybody could do it. Mm -hmm. It just takes you knowing what you're doing, but the information is out there. If I get a group of friends to want to invest with me, they can't. Why? Because there's all these rules and regulations and I have to be registered with the SEC right. and this. Meanwhile, you could get that same money and go to Vegas and the government doesn't care. You could gamble <laughs> it all away. But when you go to invest with your friends, it's too dangerous. You have to be an accredited investor and all this other BS. That's crazy. I, That's it, crazy. It's crazy when you think about it yeah. from that perspective. I'm like, what? This thing is a gambit. <laughs> like, yeah. So my focus right now is to start uh, get registered, start the syndication. Once I start the syndication, we have a lot of past clients who are wealthy. I mean, these, these people are sitting liquid on a lot of money and they're like, Lucas, I, I know real estate is a good investment. I don't have the time to deal with it. Can I just give you the money? I said, well, you can't because so my number one goal right now is to get the syndication, syndication. going. Yeah. So is that like a type of business category, like an LLC, but it's like a syndication or, or like, yes. what is it? So a syndication is a real estate syndication has to be, it's similar. You ever heard of a REIT? 
Yes. Mm, so yeah. there's a, a, a REIT, and a REIT, a syndication is a form of a REIT in a way, but much smaller. Uh, a REIT, the returns get so watered down by yeah. the time they go back to your average investor that threw a thousand bucks in there. Mm-hmm. In, in a REIT, you're missing out on some of the biggest benefits in real estate, which is the biggest benefits in real estate is tax write offs mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and leverage and cash flow. Right. Okay. So it, with the syndication, a much smaller scale, we will go out and let's say we buy and, you know, we all pour resources together. We buy an apartment building every quarter, the profits. So in this scenario, I'm making seven or $8,000 a month in cash flow. Right. If I had a partner, that partner would get 50% of that every single right. month or mm-hmm. in a syndication every single quarter, the check uh-huh. will be paid out. If and when we sell it, they will get 50% of the profit. Yeah. And the biggest thing is they will get a K-1, which is a form that they go to file with the IRS at the end of the year that will lower mm-hmm. their tax liability to the government. Really wealthy people are purchasing real estate so they don't pay any taxes. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 in our country, everyone that I meet, I could guess right now what your biggest expense is. Number one is probably housing. Mm-hmm. Number yeah. two is your taxes. Right. So the more wealth you build and acquire and you start to understand the game, you're like, dude, my the game I'm playing today is like, how do I pay the least amount of taxes? Right. <laughs> it's For as simple sure. as that. Yeah. So to answer your question, once like the goal is to figure out the syndication first, and then I want to, I want to, Tell more people about this, dude. Mm-hmm. It's as simple yeah. as that. Like, I don't care if I if I make money in that platform or not, but like, why are they not teaching this in school? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and in the syndication, you mentioned it lowers your tax liability, and that's because of the depreciation on the correct. property. Exactly. How does a property like an apartment building depreciate for those that don't really understand that? Yeah. So yeah. great question. So you could depreciate an asset or an apartment building over 27 years. Mm. Or you could do something that I'm in the process of doing now, which is a cost segregation analysis. So cost segregation analysis is you go, you call this company, I call this company in Bellevue. They're going to charge me 8,000 bucks to do this analysis. Right. They're going to go, uh, I own a, a 18 uh, unit apartment building in Tennessee. They're going to do a walkthrough virtually of that apartment building. And they're going to say, okay, the apartment building the total cost of the a- asset, let's say it's 2 million bucks, but the actual building or structure itself is worth about 30% of that, right? So let's say $600,000. Right. They will do a whole analysis, a bunch of paperwork just to show the IRS. And now I get to deduct that $600,000 against my income that I made. Yeah. So if I made a million dollars, I'm taking, I'm not paying taxes on a million. I'm paying taxes on 400,000. Interesting. Uh, right. Is yeah. that only for one year though? Or how it's does only work? for one year. Okay. So instead of depreciating it over the 27 mm. years, I'm depreciating all of it in year one. Gotcha. Now here's, here's where it gets really interesting. And, and the more, like once I found out about this, like I started watching what wealthy people do. Like what, what, what are the really, really wealthy doing? Right. I have a client who every year he goes out and purchases a piece of real estate. And I never knew much about this guy. He's kind of very like, you know, very polite. I, he's a business owner. That's all I know. And he was purchasing this property, a million dollar condo. This was two years ago. And it was a horrible investment. I said, Wilbur, man, like the HOA in this condo is 1200 bucks a month. <laughs> like, it, this That's is ridiculous. not like, what are you going to do? Rent this out? And he's like, <laughs> nah, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I said, what do you mean? What? He said, if I don't buy it, the money's going to go to the government. Hmm. Uh, and I'm like, ah, so he doesn't care what he's buying because he just needs the <laughs> right. ride off. Right. So, Man. and it's crazy. Like, this is how you get guys that are able to justify how does someone make sense of buying a private jet right, or a mega yacht? How does that right. person make sense? So they're able to write it they're off. They're able to write it <laughs> off. And it's crazy, man. Cause like it, it's growing up broke and you start to learn this stuff. You're like, this yeah. is a gambit, dude. Right. You know, this is the craziest thing. Like to me, it was like mind boggling. Like what? This yeah. is legal. And I like, I highlight this as an example to my team all the time. 
I paid more in taxes when I was a bartender than what I do today. That's wild. Isn't, Isn't it crazy it? how That's that works? And wild. it's all legal, all by the book. Man. So I say this because, dude, our generation needs to learn how to play this game. Number one, the game needs to be restructured because it's fucked up. Yeah, you know, like. Right. But I don't. I don't even know how to get started on that. It took me long enough just to figure out the the basic rules of the game today. Yeah. And we need it. We need to educate people in regards to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, that that's kind of my you know, and I don't know if I'll do that through like an online video course. There's a few guys that I follow now in the real estate space that do a yeah. good job of educating people. Um, but there's plenty of business out there man you know like i more more people need to learn and 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 get the basic understanding of this yeah so speaking of expensive assets mm -hmm. what's the most expensive deal that you've been a part of Ooh. i did a 4.7 million dollar last year last wow. year so 4.7 million um and the nicest clients ever dude like just great people and funny enough i sold him this house and uh he is now he owns uh lake union sea ray in seattle oh wow. and he's helping me sell my my yacht like i had about this yacht i had it for a couple of years and yeah and it was fun and made money out of it because I created a business out of it. Like, oh, right nice. Off and shit. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So he's helping me sell the, the boat now, the Love Canal. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but it just the great. Love Canal. The Love Canal. <laughs> nice. the name of the yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It, so that was the biggest deal that I've been a part of. Yeah. I think it was 4.6, 4.7 million. Has anybody um, ever tried to buy a home with crypto recently or? Yeah. So. I'm super fascinated by crypto. I'm heavily invested in crypto and I, I do believe it as the future. Yeah. We have yet, it, there's been transactions in the United States that were done all through crypto. Um, I haven't had any clients reach out. I have actually, I've had a client who owns a lot of crypto and he asked me about it, but there's no clear solution yet. Mm. And the challenging part is because of title and escrow. It's, I see. The, mm. It's, I believe that in the next probably two to three years, there will be ways uh, to make it more efficient to where title and escrow is all done through the blockchain and you don't need a physical title and escrow. Right. And that will be a more efficient way because title and escrow, as we know it today, is like, dude, that's a business who their profit margins are through the roof. Mm -hmm. Like it's, they're just handling the money. They, yeah. And, and, and the fees you pay these guys is just yeah, mind boggling. And right. you could do, you could do all of that through the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a matter of time. And there, there's already platforms out there where, for example, it's basically a syndication, but they could, they could divide it up. It's all through tokens and you could divide it up. You could buy 1% of a property if you want. You could buy $10 of this property. I've heard about that, yeah. You know, Chase is kind of the one that turned me on to it. Uh, so I think I think crypto will disrupt yeah. most industries as we know it. Insurance is an easy one, real estate, mortgage, yeah. title, escrow, the finance industry. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in, in crypto. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned in another interview too that you think crypto will uh, level the playing field for everyone? 100%. Uh, what do you mean by that exactly? So he here's what I mean. It it's, think about this concept. Like if you want to send, if you want to wire money to someone today out of the country, it's going to cost you probably about 30 bucks to wire that money. Mm -hmm. For somebody who's really wealthy, they don't care. It doesn't impact them. From someone who doesn't have a lot of money and send sending that money to their family out of the country. Mm -hmm. That thirty dollars matters, right? Does it cost the bank thirty dollars? Absolutely not. Uh, it's a freaking <laughs> gambit, bro. right? It, it's so if you like, I spent months. I I've been in crypto since I've been in Bitcoin since twenty sixteen because my best friend, who's uh, Doctor Novak's son, who we talked about earlier, my best friend got me into it, and then over the course of the last year, I got my hands on every book. I could come across that talks about Bitcoin and the history of money and money as we know it today is in the process of failing. Mm -hmm. The currency as we know it is in the process of failing. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. 
and currency has failed throughout history. Like yeah. you look at the Roman Empire, like they diluted their gold coin so much that in the course of a year, it was a fraction of a gold coin and the Roman Empire eventually collapsed. Right. So currencies, the natural life cycle of a currency is for it to collapse. Right. Now, you kind of zoom out and you look at, okay, the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Every, just about every country holds the US dollar in their banking system. Right. What happens if that collapses? Right. Because it's not oh. backed by anything. It's not backed by anything. Yeah. We went off the gold standard in, in what was it, 60s or 70s, right. Nixon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that collapses, what's going to be, what's going to become the reserve currency of the world? That's and crazy. It, it, if you think about, you know, like, look at what they're do doing in Honduras with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. it, these are people that, you know, when they made money in Honduras, and or is it El Salvador? Is that El, I think El, it's El, Sal Salvador. El Salvador? Right, right. Yeah. right. Um, it, it, they would, you know, whenever they come across money, they would buy bricks because bricks mm -hmm. would be a better store of wealth huh. than their actual currency. Wow. I remember being a kid in Brazil and being in my dad's office, and my dad had a stack of money like this. I'm like, what the hell is that? What is that? And it was money, yeah. but it wasn't the actual currency of Brazil. And my dad is like, oh, that was the currency from in the past. I'm like, what do you mean the currency in the past? See, Brazil had their currency collapse huh. in the 70s. So he wow. had a stack of money that was worth <laughs> nothing. That's like, crazy. Isn't it? it and like, same thing in Argentina. Like, we are so sheltered in this country that we don't experience that reality until recently. We're starting to experience that reality a little bit. Oh, yeah. Because you go to the gas station, you're like, yeah, $5.50. Wow. I, I can't go to the grocery store and not spend 100 bucks. You know, right. like, yeah. so we're experiencing inflation like we've never seen before. So, I think crypto will give everyone a better chance because it will it, everyone around the world will have a better store of wealth than we've ever had. What kind of advice would you give to those people that like I said whether it's for an investment or for a living? Yeah, so my number piece of advice, number one piece of advice I would give anybody is get rid of your cash. <laughs> you know, regardless if yeah. you buy real estate here or out of state, like, doesn't matter. Deploy your cash. Your cash is being devalued at such a fast rate. And it's it's garbage, dude. It's little pieces of paper. Yeah, right. Like, my real estate assets are appreciating like 20% a year. Yeah. What the? What? You Crazy. know, so it, it what's happening now is people with assets are seeing their net worth grow substantially while people without assets are, are struggling. And, and that's because we yeah. printed a lot of money. So to answer your question, I would say get committed to deploying that capital. Yeah. Um, the second thing I would recommend is uh, find, like, number one, do your own research and know the basics. You know, you could go and listen to Bigger Pockets, which is a great podcast, oh, yeah. or go visit their website and you could learn a lot. You could pick up a, a few basic books on Amazon and watch a few YouTube videos for you to get a basic understanding of it. Yeah. And then the third thing I'd recommend them to do is once you have a good basic understanding, find a realtor or a person or a mentor that they could piggyback ideas off of that will guide them to whatever they're looking to accomplish. Cause yeah. you know, even if you, I think buying real estate all over the U S is, is a good idea. You know, I think, mm -hmm. I think there are, even if you can't afford here, great man, go buy yeah. investment property somewhere, you know, and yeah. like you could buy real estate today with 3% down. Like that's crazy. Right. You right. know, like you could control a half a million dollar asset with 15,000 bucks. Yeah. And that if, if last year repeats this year, the half a million dollar asset will go up by 15%. Yeah. That's crazy. Like, wow. And it's been going up by double, double digits in our era for the last five to six years. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, and it's going to continue, man. We printed way too much money. We printed, we printed 40% of all the U S dollars ever created in the last two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, we're going to see price prices, of assets, including real estate all across the nation will continue to go up.
And speaking of purchasing real estate outside of the state, you mentioned that you bought a multi-unit property in Tennessee, right? Yep. How did you do that? Where did you go out there and were you looking or do you have kind of a team that helps you with on the investment side? Yeah, so great question. So once you learn how to analyze deals, you could do it anywhere in the United States. Gotcha. The biggest challenge then becomes getting to know that area really well. So I did my research by figuring out, okay, are the macroeconomics of this area good? Yeah. Meaning are more people moving there? Our companies moving there is the population growing is to have good job opportunities or their tech companies moving to the area. Mm. And these were all good trends showcasing that, yeah, this is an area that's growing. So after I identified that area, I went out and found a really good realtor. And that realtor put me on to a property manager, helped me analyze the deal. And I bought a duplex and I've never even been in the city. I, wow. I bought a duplex in Clarksville, Tennessee which is 45 wow. minutes north of Nashville. It's a secondary market. Secondary markets do really good. So think like mm. Seattle went up a lot, but Tacoma went up way more than Seattle. Yeah. The last few years, people were, were sleeping on Tacoma or secondary yeah. markets, right? So I bought a duplex in, in Clarksville. In the course yeah. of a year, that duplex did really well. I was making like, I think it was like $600 or $700 a month in cash flow on the wow. duplex. So since the duplex did well, I'm like, okay, let's go bigger. Mm. Let's do an 18 unit. And I bought an apartment, 18 unit apartment building in the same city. Gotcha. So you tested the market on a smaller small. scale and then just built up there. Right. And went bigger. And, you know, the next deal, like, uh, I, we want to keep doing bigger and bigger deals. The, yeah. the, 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 ca the numbers are so much better on bigger deals. The, the challenge is raising capital and coming up with the capital, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, um, but you know, some of these 40, 50, 60 unit apartment buildings, those yeah. things are cash cows, man. They bring in so much money. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And gotcha. I know we're running a bit close to time here, but one of the questions I, I want to ask is, you know, for any viewers listening right now, let's say like, you know, we have some viewers out there that are like, Hey, I have, you know, five, 10 grand in cash. I know you were talking about your syndication earlier. Mm. Like, is there a way that, you know, people who didn't buy from you or aren't real estate agents on your team, can they invest yeah. with you on the syndication? So unfortunately, no, the, and it's not because of me, it's because of, of the government. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> all these stupid regulations, dude. So that, uh, you know, most likely our syndication will only be open to accredited investors. So what that means is like people that are already rich, which is unfortunate. Mm. Um, but, you know, if somebody's watching out there, my biggest piece of advice is go and find a way to purchase something for yourself. You could yeah. scrape up 10,000 bucks and buy yourself a little condo because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. all you need is 3% down or, okay, you don't have 10,000 bucks. Go find a buddy. You already have a roommate anyways and, and be like, dude, hey, let's get our shit together for two to three months. Let's save up some money and buy a little house and we'll rent out every room in this house and we won't have a, a, a mortgage payment because we're renting everything out. Right. Yeah. So find a solution for wherever you are in regardless of your financial picture. Yeah. And we can help you with that, right? If you need ways to brainstorm, uh, even if you're out of state, we could connect you with the right person. We could give yeah. you the right education for you to you know, figure it out. So cool. Yeah, that's great advice. We're running out of time, but I do want to touch on your social media channels here before we stop. So um, we'll have all the links in our description too. So yeah, make sure y'all reach out to Luke. Um, has a great team here in the Seattle area. Do you help people outside of the Seattle area right we now? We do. We do. Okay. Yeah. We we cover Snohomish, Pierce County. Uh Compass is we went public last year. So I mean we we there's Compass Realtors all across the nation. So we'll connect awesome. you with the the right realtor. So awesome. Okay. Awesome. Cool, cool. Well, thank you guys for watching this episode of the Untapped Potential. Make sure to hit like, subscribe on the video, and catch us next time. Mm -hmm.